following. Brother Cliff has been experiencing a lot of that where he's going. So we are going to let him loose. If you have a need in your life, if you have a need in your physical body, if you're struggling with something, if you need a breakthrough financially, it's an all-inclusive work, what Christ did on the cross. It wasn't just for your sins. One of the things I know God wanted me to get across today, um, I just sense an urgency to reach the lost. And I think that he wants to use this season just to bring that to the forefront. We're, we're, we're commissioned to, to bring the good news to this world. And it's good news, it's not bad news. I'm going to start reading a little bit, John 4, verse 4. I'll give you a minute to turn there if you have your Bible. If you want to find it on your iPad, your iPhone, your iBible. John 4, verse 4. I mean, Jesus demonstrated on how to do this. John 4, verse 4. And around noon, as he approached the village, he came to Jacob's well, located... I skipped that word on purpose because I don't want to chop up any Hebrew or any other words, so I just skipped them from now on. So he came to the village. It doesn't matter the name of it. And he came to Jacob's well, located on the parcel of ground Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jesus was tired from the long walk in the hot sun and sat wearily beside the well. Well, let's just stop right there. It's just, please, when you read the Bible, it was a long walk in the hot sun, and he was tired. Have you been there? You feel like talking about Jesus to other people when you're in this condition? No, I don't. I just feel like sitting down, getting a drink, and it's about me. But notice, he said, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus asked her for a drink. He was alone at the time, as his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised that the Jew would ask a despised Samaritan for anything. Usually, they wouldn't even speak to them, and she remarked about this to Jesus. He replied, if you only knew what a wonderful gift God has for you and who I am, you would ask me for living water. Well, let's stop there for a second. If you only knew what a wonderful gift God has for you. This is evangelism. He didn't say, woman, you're a sinner. Don't you realize your life is a mess? You need God. He said, if you only knew what a wonderful gift God has for you. That's how you approach sinners. They know they're sinners. You don't have to tell them. And then he said this. He said, and who I am. Now, this may seem arrogant and prideful, but you can say these words, or you could at least realize that you are carrying this, the one who said these words. So therefore, you could say to someone, or at least be thinking in this situation, if you knew what I had to offer you, you would ask me of it. It's not who I am who I am in Christ, and who he makes me. But if, if you realize you're walking around with what they need. Then she went on to say in verse 11, but you don't have a rope or a bucket. She said, and this is a very deep well. Where would you get this living water? And besides, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? Just think about who she was talking to. <laughs> I mean, you got to read the Bible. You just... <laughs> This reminds me, I don't know if you ever saw the show Punked. Does anybody know who Chuck Liddell is? Chuck Liddell is one of the baddest men on earth, the MMA fighter. And they were punking him, and the cop comes up to him, and he was a fake cop, you know, an actor. And, and he asked Chuck Liddell to stand on the side. And whatever he asked Chuck Liddell to do, he asked him to do something else real quick. And he just was getting on his nerves. And Chuck Liddell squatted down. He said, stand up. And, and then he, he went back and forth, and he was getting aggravated. So, so the cop asked him, are you a tough guy? 
<laughs> what do you think? You're a tough guy? I mean, so here's he, he's asking, are, are you greater than our ancestors? Or who, who do you think you are? And he, she was speaking to the creator of the universe, asking him, if you, are you greater than our ancestors? Um, verse 12, are you greater than our ancestors, Jacob? How can you offer better water than that which he and his sons and cattle enjoyed? Again, if she knew who she was talking to. Looking back now from where she is, she's probably reading this going, <laughs> did I say that to you? <laughs> <laughs> Verse 13, Jesus replied that people soon become thirsty after drinking this water. I mean, this represents your life and the things you obtain while you're here on this earth. Whatever you're striving for, that you get temporary fulfillment from, He's saying, soon after, you'll be thirsty. You're going to want more because you have to keep getting more and keep doing more to satisfy if you're living for that. He says, but the water I give them, he said, becomes a perpetual spring within them, watering them forever with eternal life. Boy, those words are so awesome. I don't know about you, but I've experienced this. I've experienced the love of God that wells up, not from here, not from out here, but from our belly flows rivers of living water. And it's from here where he says, son, I love you. Son, I'm pleased. This is, he, and he said, once you get this, you won't have to drink, you'll, you'll be satisfied. It's, a, it's like being hooked up to IV. You never have to eat. Well, you do kind of, but I mean, it sustains you. It's, we have a, Holy Ghost just filling us and forever, never, never run dry. He says, please, sir, the woman said in verse 15, give me some of that water. Then I'll never be thirsty. And again, I won't be thirsty again and won't have to make this long trip out here every day. People are always looking for a shortcut. Verse 16. I think she's kind of getting it, but kind of in the middle. She's like, if I could have this thing where I don't have to come back here anymore, but that's not what he was talking about. Then he said, go and tell your husband. And, and Jesus told her, but I'm not married. And the woman replied, somehow this cut me off. Who has this in verse 18? I'm in 17. And the woman replied, I'm not married. I know the story. But anyway, he goes on. I don't need the rest of that verse. And he goes on. She said, no, you're not married. You've been married four times. The guy you're married with is not your husband. And then she goes back and tells everybody. She said, I perceive you're a prophet. Then she goes back and tells everybody, I met a man who knows everything. And then she comes back with everybody and he ministers to them. But we see how he dealt with this woman. He didn't condemn her. He met her where she was at. The gifts of the Spirit were in operation. And, and because of that, they listened. And notice he was talking to somebody who was hungry. He wasn't, didn't have to force it on them. We're going to see another story where Jesus, led by the Spirit, and don't forget that the Bible says he prayed, got up early and prayed, prayed often. And in one verse it says he only does that which his father told him to do. So we see one of these incidences where I believe Jesus prayed the night before and God said, go down to the water. And when you see these people, I want you to talk to those people. And if you'll do it that way, you'll have 100% success when you try to share the gospel. 100% success. Matthew 4.18. Matthew 4.18, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. He said, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. 
So what do we see here? They were about their business. Whatever your occupation is, whatever it is that you're doing, they were casting their net into the lake. They were busy. They were working. I don't know about you, but when you're at work and someone's working hard or concentrating, I could picture Tony behind his desk during tax season, you know, crunching numbers, going over things, and, and someone wanted to walk up to him, and Jesus said, come with me. He's like, you're interrupting me. I was in the middle of adding. I was in the, you know... We're in the middle of my life. Don't, don't you know we got to sleep down here, Lord? I'm, I'm doing this. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Thank God Tony said, yes, I'll follow. And notice their response. They left their nets at once. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to quit their job and just come and join the church and go full time. And No, that was a specific call for them. But their heart's attitude was... Obey quickly. Don't play games with it. Obey quickly. And what did Jesus said he would do to them? He would make them fishers of men. I love to fish. And, and there's a lot of diff different techniques to fishing. When you go fishing, there's different lures that you use for different times of the day, when it's sunny, when it's overcast, whether it's night, whether it's morning, what type of fish you want to catch. And you need to educate yourself. You don't just keep using the same lure in salt water and fresh water. It, it just, you, you have to know what you're doing. You have to educate yourself. You have to be prepared. And he said, I'll make you fishers of men. The one thing that you absolutely need to do, because I know anyone in here that's a believer, and the one thing that I feel when you've experienced this awesome gift, when you've experienced this forgiveness and this love of God, you cannot keep it to yourself. And I know anybody in here who has experienced that, if they have the opportunity, if they're at work and you overhear someone talking about the Bible movie and they're asking a question, yeah, well, what about this? And you have the answer, you'd probably chime in. And if they said, tell me more, I have, you would give them, you would do it. The things that, thing that bothers people about sharing the gospel is having to walk up to a stranger because they think they're supposed to walk up to a stranger and say, do you know Jesus? <laughs> there was nothing and would have nothing been appealing about that in my former life. <laughs> yeah, I do. Shut up. Get out of here. And I would have figured out a way to make fun of them. And I was good at it. And it's funny how one opinion can change everybody else's. I remember I asked a little kid once. I know I've shared this before, but it's been a while. There was a little kid, and he asked me for a nickel for... They, they used to, in, even in my time, they had the, the fruit pops that were a nickel. And he said, can I have money for a fruit pop? I said, sure. Can I ask you a question? Do you know Jesus? He said, yeah. I said, well, who is he? Tell me. And he, he stopped, and he thinks, and he turns around, and he goes, he's right there, because his friend's name was Jesus. And they didn't call him... <laughs> they didn't, they didn't call him Jesus. They called him Jesus. And they said, he's right there. I know him. And I was like, here, here's your nickel. I just I kind of don't know what to do with that one. <laughs> you know, so the question is, what the, the thing that bothers people is that cold contact. But that's not what it's about. It's personal evangelism. It's, it's finding opportunities, being aware and looking for opportunities. You well, I don't know what to say. Not saying anything is just saying Jesus loves you. Or I just, God was so good to me. Share your testimony. Listen, I don't have all the answers, but I just want to let you know, since I met God, my life is better. That's enough. You could say those words. And if you want to know more, I know some people that would love to talk to you. You want me to take you there? I'll call them right now. I'll pick you up. I'll, I mean, but this is the key that we're looking for because all of you have had those experiences, whether it's at the grocery store, at a restaurant with a waiter, whether it's been at work, a family member, where, where a conversation had started and you've had one of these conversations. And you've had the conversation and you left that night and said, yeah, we'll talk. And you never did again. I need you on your iPhone, on your iPad, to make a list when you have a fish that nibbles 
you need to write their name down and start praying for them. Everyone in here needs to have a list of 12 to 15 people, without a doubt. And if you talk to someone who's interested and you call back and they're brushing you off, take their name off the list, put someone else's name. There's people on my list that I'm mentoring. There's people on the list that I've witnessed to. You know, I don't know, my friend Joey, I don't know if he's here this morning, but when I first got saved, you know what he said to me almost 30 years ago? Next week will be 30 years. It's pretty awesome just to think God has been able to keep me for 30 years. That's incredible. Don't laugh, Buck. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But what he said to me was, he wasn't ready then. He said, but don't give up on me. And this is 30 years later. He came to church maybe a year ago for the first time. Came once. Then he's been coming pretty regularly the last couple of weeks. 30 years ago, he said, don't give up on me. I said, you know what that means. I said, I'm not going to leave you alone now because you asked for it. (laughs) And sooner or later, you're going to come. And throughout the years, I would call him a couple times a year at minimum just to see if he was ready yet. And I never took him off my list. And I would pray for him. When I think of praying for people that are lost, I would pray for him. I had another friend I used to go fishing with. And I start the day out the same every time. Oh, what an interesting story. I'm just looking back to what God has been doing over the last 30 years. We are here at the end times. Revival's here. People are hungry. We need to go get them. But he was, wanted nothing to do with the gospel. Not a thing. His father was an addict. He wanted nothing to do with his dad or, or was like, just, yeah, my dad needs that. I don't. So I'd go fishing. I'd say, all right, let me just get this out of the way. I said, the day you're ready, I want to be the one that leads you to the Lord. So I'm just going to ask you, are you ready? No? Okay, it's done. Let's go fish. And that was it. That's all I would say. He found himself a couple of years later after having a, an accident or something, being on painkillers and getting addicted to him. So all that judgment he did and looking down on his dad and how can you do this, he found out how he can do this. And he turned to God. And and once again, the biggest honor I can have in life is when someone wants to turn to God, they go, where are you? Let me call Jack. There's no greater honor. But I started out by saying there's different baits. Some people enjoy taking tracks and going out on the street and talking to people and they don't mind being made fun of and people laughing at them. They don't care. Some people just could not do that. Some people share the gospel with people in different ways. There was this one lady. Her name was Ann Kimmel. She lived in a building and the guy cleaned the carpet. First of all, she couldn't sing. But she'd walk up to people and say, You're working so hard. I appreciate you. Do you mind if I sing a song for you? And she'd sing a song for him, and she'd get results. (laughs) Just strange. (laughs) They would listen to her. And, And there's different ways to do this, but you have to find where you're comfortable. But the thing I have to get across to you is however you do it or whenever the opportunity comes up, when you find somebody who is hungry for God, write their name down and pray for them and follow up. You know, there's different ways to hook different fish. When bluefish are on top of the water bubbling around, you could throw your sneaker in on a hook and you'll catch a bluefish. And that's, if anything is shiny on your sneaker, it will work. And then there's striped bass. They, they grab the bait, they spit it out. They grab the bait, they spit it out. Anytime they grab the bait, you try to set the hook, you'll pull it right out of their mouth. The third time, they'll grab it, and then they start running with it. That's when you set the hook. So you got to figure, if you had somebody that bit the bait, you, you, you don't want to, you need to get saved right now. Well, if they're a striped bass, it's not going to work. If they're a bluefish, it'll work. 
You need to know how to talk to people. You need to be led by the Spirit. I would probably say less than five times or at least not much more than that, have I walked up to somebody I hardly knew and say, if you don't get right with God, you're going to go to hell. In 30 years, five times, God had me be that direct. Every other time is love. Love covers a multitude of sin. The love of God leads to repentance. But sometimes people need to hear, you're a hypocrite. You say you believe in God, look what you're doing. Some people, very few, need to hear that. And unfortunately, people have that backwards. 90% of the time, they're telling people they're hypocrites and you're, you're evil and you're no good and you need to get saved. And, and, and by the way, hey, God loves you. No, it's got to be the other way around. We look in Hebrews verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. And, and this is, and I don't know how far we're going to get today. We're winding down. I'm going to read a little bit, but I want to get to verse 3. In verse 12, in verse 1, it's talking about people who went before us. It says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed away, all these veterans cheering us on. And another version that talks about the cloud of witnesses. It means we'd better get on with it, strip down and start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and listen to this one, who both began and finished this race we're in. He did this. He conquered sin in the flesh. He's the author and finisher of our faith because he did this already. We can't look up to heaven and say to God, you don't know what it's like being human. You don't know what it's like to deal with sin. You don't know what it's like to deal with people. You're up in heaven. You're God. You don't know what it's like to be down here. We cannot say that to him. He's the, he did this race that he's asking you to run, and he didn't do it as God. He did it as man. And then it says, study how he did it. That's pretty interesting. If you want to get to where someone's been, find out how they did it and then copy them. And this is how he did it. He never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, or whatever else. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside of God. We were what he was striving for. He's, we are his great reward. That alongside being glorified back with his father. In verse 3, it says, When you find yourself flagging in your faith, or weak in your faith, or you're struggling, or the cares of this life, or getting, and you say, I got to do this, I got to do that. He said, when you find yourself in that place, it says, go over that story again, item by on, item. The long litany of hostility he plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. We're approaching Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and all the things that Jesus had to go through, all the things that he suffered on your behalf. It says, think about these things item by item. Think about what he went through on your behalf. You know, you say, well, people are talking about me. People talked about him. He was physically beaten. You know, in a nutshell, the gospel story and our responsibility, it starts out in Romans 5.8. It says, God demonstrates his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's, that's, a pretty, that's good news. You know, it's, while I was out doing the things I was doing, not even thinking about God, not caring about what God thought about it, he died for me. In Matthew 7, 11, it says, You then, if you then, you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The, the point I wanted to bring out there is talking about the love of God. And if you haven't had a child yet, you don't know what it's like to really love somebody. I heard someone say having a child is like having your heart walk outside of your body. 
And if you think you love your child, he says, how much more? If you being evil, evil means less. God is good, you're evil. God is more, we're less, is all that's saying. It's not saying we're evil. He's saying God's better than you. That's all that phrase means. As good as we think we are in this fallen state, as much as we think we love our kids and much as we think we would do for our kids, not only does God love us more, he demonstrated it. He gave the ultimate price. Even more than giving your own life is giving your child's life. I'd much rather give my life than one of my children. That's how much he loves us. Another interesting factor when we think about winning somebody to Jesus or sharing the gospel. In Matthew 16, verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man is. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he said to them, But who do you say I am? There is the question. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered to him, listen to this response. This makes the difference of heaven and hell for somebody. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. There's a revelation that comes of who Jesus is that makes the difference of where you spend eternity. And I can't convince anybody with fancy words. It's something that God reveals to their heart. Now, he uses the preached word, the gospel, the truth to convict people. But ultimately, the Bible says one waters, one plants, but God gives the increase. This is the increase that God gives the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. When you have that revelation, they can't beat it out of you with a baseball bat. My concern is how many people are in church who have not really not had that revelation. Flesh and blood has convinced them. Wisdom. They've, they've switched their membership from one church to another because this one makes more sense, but they really never dug in far enough to really get a revelation of who Jesus is. As far as I can see it, the Bible says if you had that revelation, there would be fruit in your life to demonstrate it. It's not just the religious duty that you're following through anymore. It's a real, living, loving relationship with God in heaven. One thing that you'll have to do and one thing that people will have to do, and this is what changed my life in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when? When you search for me with how much of your heart? All of your heart. And no one could search for you. It starts with a real desire to want to know God. I wanted to know truth. There was a part of me that said, God, if you're out there and you really love me and what happened on that cross is real, I want to know. But right now, I'm not sure. I was honest with God, but I was genuine. I was sincere. God, to me, or Jesus, was in the same category as the tooth fairy, Jack and the Beanstalk. They were fairy tales. I just wanted to know, is this real or is this another fairy tale? You know, when I looked at the calendar and realized what A.D. and B.C. really meant, I realized that Jesus wasn't a fairy tale. I still didn't know if he was the son of God or not, but all of a sudden, he wasn't a cartoon figure anymore. I, I, it was interesting how I could study in school and they would teach me in history about people who lived the same time Jesus did, and I had no problem believing that they existed, even that the only way I could know they existed because somebody wrote about it, and it was 2,000 years later, but we talk about certain people, and we say, yeah, that's who they were, they and have no problem believing that they really existed, but somehow, growing up, Jesus didn't fit as someone who was real. Until I looked at the calendar and went, wait a minute. If he wasn't real, our calendar wouldn't be based on his birth. That's not just the story in the Bible. He was really born. 
And then it doesn't take much to do a little bit of research to realize he was crucified. Was or was he not the Son of God is a different, you can argue that, but no one could say that Jesus really exists. Unless you could say, I mean, you could even go as close as today. Does President Obama exist? No comments. He's our president. He's our leader. We pray for him. The only way we know he exists, we see it on TV or read it in the newspaper. How many people have physically seen? I know some of you have. How many people have physically seen and shook hands with the president to know that he exists? You're relying on TV, which can be easily manipulated, or something that was said or, or hearsay. So when it came to reading the Bible about things that happened back then, I, I, I was, had a hard time making it real. But eventually I got there because my heart was sincere. I'm going to share one more thing and then I'm going to let Brother Cliff come up and minister to you. There's so many reasons why people don't believe and none of them are really original thoughts. I don't know that anybody who really sat down, and I know there are some, but I haven't really experienced. Yes, I have, matter of fact. There was, there was one guy I'm thinking of now that genuinely looked into this and came up with a conclusion that there was no God and not just repeated what they heard somebody else say. It's an echo. Someone says this, and then they say, well, this is what I believe. It's not what you believe. It was somebody else believed. They said it, and now you're repeating it because... The only way you could believe something is if you researched it. These are some of the things people say. And, and these, an echo, first of all, is a reply that repeats what has just been said. Most people's response to the gospel is that's exactly what it is. And most of these things, the author is in hell. Satan himself is the author of some of these things. Man wrote the book. It can't be proven scientifically. What about people who have never heard or grew up in another religion? I don't want to go to church because people are hypocrites. And you could fill in the blank on this one. I knew a guy. I'll give you a thousand reasons about a guy that you knew that you should not go to church. All, the only thing they want is your money. If God is good, then why? I have one answer to that question, because I don't have all the answers, but I had to think about this long and hard. I, I ran into a friend, and he says, I have a hard time believing in God, because how can he let a little girl who's never done anything wrong get sick and die? And, and that kind of brings in the question of sovereignty of God. I don't understand why if God was going to use sovereignty and his ability to do whatever he wanted, why he wouldn't use that ability or that option when his own son's life was on the line. So whatever he put in place, for whatever reason we may not understand that allows us to live on this earth that sometimes is hell on earth, he didn't change that when his own son's life was at stake. And if he didn't do it then, he's not going to do it because he has things that he's set in place. And we may not understand all the reasons, but if he didn't stop it then, but he did something about it. He didn't, he didn't force you to get saved. He don't force you to get healed, but he did something about it. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for all your sins so your sins could be forgiven, so you could become in a right relationship with God. And on that same place, right before he was crucified, he was whipped, and by his stripes it says you're healed. He paid for it. Healing belongs to us. But he left the one factor, faith, to receive it. And I'm about to let Brother Cliff loose right now to pray. If you have a need, don't come up here hoping you get your answer, because you won't. Come up here believing what Jesus did on the cross was enough to meet any need you have. That the curse of the law is the reason why there's destruction and things in this earth that shouldn't be here. But Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law. 
Come up ready to receive. This is what I'm going to tell you. I want you to come up. I want you to line up in order. Come up the center aisle. You'll leave around the sides. If you need to leave, slip out quietly. Don't talk in the pews. You guys do awesome in that way. And if you would like to give towards Brother Cliff's trip coming up, find an usher and give them the envelope. But I'm turning it over to Cliff right now, and I'm exp- There. Listen, I just want to encourage you real quick. While I was sitting here, um, the Lord started reminding me of people that have been giving me testimonies of being healed. And uh, Nancy Strongo in uh, Anaheim, California, we went and I went to consult with her about some legal stuff about renting. And while I was sitting there, we didn't do a service. We didn't do any altar call. We didn't do any offering. We didn't do this. But I said, can I pray for you? Because I knew she had some ailments. She said she went home. Her knee was healed. She had some kind of a um, issue from, with her blood or something like this. That got healed. She said she was taking something that swelled her face. She said that was the only thing. She didn't know if she should just start immediately, stop taking this medicine or wean herself off. And then I was just at a church in, in um, an hour west of, of Detroit, and Sherry Owens came up to me after I talked about testimonies. She said, the first time you laid hands on, on my back, I had, on my knee, I had an arthritic. She said, immediately it went away. And she said, now listen to this. Some of us, we're dealing with chronic pain because of, of, we have an old body. Hello? Hello? And what happens is, is you have to stretch your faith. I have injuries from doing sports that I just don't let go and then go, well, I got healed. I tend to put more faith on that area. Do you understand? If you don't understand, let it go over your head. But I'm saying this for a reason. In Doha, when I prayed for the general manager, who I had to pay his, the bill to, he had a cane, and he said when I prayed for him, his knee got completely healed. That was in another land. Down in Florida, Live Oak, Florida, a year ago, we prayed for a lady who came up. I was doing an altar call for people who wanted to win souls. She came up with a walker. She'd been in a car accident. Go look on our Facebook, and you'll see her testimony. She threw away her walker. God is moving left and right. Now, listen, this is why I'm telling you this, and, I, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, okay? But... Pastor Jack, the Spirit of God is here, and there's a liberty here. It amazed me when he called Brother Joe and his wife, and I go, oh my gosh, I just started getting a word for him. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm telling you this to encourage your faith. And can I be bold? I'm asking, because I heard some people, and I'm going to be bold, because while I was sitting here, the Lord started telling me people need some help, okay? And so I'm going to do that because... I'm going to be obedient to God. And when I'm obedient to God, God's going to begin to move. And that will stir your faith to come and receive from him. But really quickly, where the spirit of the Lord, there's liberty. When there's liberty, we can be bold. Where there's boldness, you'll see reactions. Okay? We'll see response. Kathy, come up real quick. While we're, while Pastor Jack was talking, I saw a crown of thorns around your heart. You got a broken heart. Listen, he wants to heal that broken heart. He can see you through anything. Amen? Amen? Say amen with me. Amen? Lift your hands. Listen, if you you have a need, just say, hey, there's the Spirit of God, right?